Kalispera says, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a, a great pleasure uh, to welcome you to Stockton University. It is one of our first public events uh, that we've had. Uh, certainly for the Hellenic Studies, it's our first public event. So uh, thank you for joining us. We are very pleased to have uh, tonight's program. It's sponsored by the uh, Dean uh, C. and Zoe S. Uh, Pappas Interdisciplinary Center for Hellenic Studies. And this is from the uh, Classical Humanities Society of South Jersey uh, lecture series. Uh, this lecture series is the oldest lecture series on campus, and it was founded by Dr. Fred Mensch and Professor Constantelos. And so it has good classical roots. Uh, and tonight's program will also I, um, focus on the classical roots of, of opera. And so we're very pleased to have tonight's um, uh, performance and uh, with commentary. And it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, our professor of history, uh, who herself is a trained opera uh, um, a singer as well as a, a, a scholar and she directs all of our programs and is the orat Stockton Oratorio and all of the wonderful work that she has done on our campus. So we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Beverly Vaughn. Well, thank you. He said professor of history, did he? Oh, well, his history is my program. I'd like, I, we'd love to have you, our professor of music. Thank you so Pardon much. me. Thank you. Thank you. And I was so glad when he asked me. He said, "Beverly, will you introduce him?" I said, "Yes," because it's opera. It's that wonderful musical drama, right? That we're going to our artists are going to tell us about. Especially Constance Mirovich will tell us about the history of opera, how it started, and what the influences that had to do it with it musically and the influences that had to do with it culturally. But Dr. Papa Dimitri said something very interesting. He said that the classical studies were started by Professor Constantelos and Professor Fred Mensch. But you know what? Am I correct in this? Is that Professor Mensch taught Latin and Professor Constantelos taught Greek. How much more classic can you be? And we're going to find that in opera as well. For example, some of the things that we'll be starting in, and she's going to explain, we're going to be starting in the early Renaissance period. And he, our artist has chosen things, has chosen represented works right from the very opening days of opera or the early 1600s. And then we're going to be moving to the beginning of the of the next period of the Baroque period with the father of the harpsichord music, the father of arias. He's going to be singing something by them. Then he has the nerve, the nerve to sing one of my favorite operas from the Rococo, an aria from the Rococo period. That's that period in between Renaissance and, and, and into the Baroque and into the Viennese classical period. He's going to be singing something from that and then he's going to end with one of the greatest composers, early composers of opera at the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s. Wait till you hear that selection. Then he has a special surprise for us. So I am exceedingly excited to talk about, and let me put on Sue's glasses. Sue, raise your hands so everybody can give you an applause. Thank you. I am so excited to talk about Constance. Oh my goodness, Constance Mirovich. She is a scholar and a teacher specializing in religious studies and art history. She has written many articles on culture and intellectual history. She holds degrees from the National University of Athens, as well as from Vanderbilt University. We're excited. Put your hands, she's gonna come in a moment, but put your hands together for her. We're excited. And then, we're going to have Mary Jo Newman. Oh my goodness. When I read about Mary Jo, I said, I have to meet this lady. She's one of the most acclaimed opera coaches in New York City. Oh my goodness. She served, she served as assistant conductor for the New York City Opera, where she's prepared both traditional and contemporary repertoire. Bravo. She participated in nine seasons of the VOX or Vox Festival of Contemporary Opera. And she's a wonderful pianist who has a 
she appeared in distinguished stages throughout the world. She holds degrees from Manus College of Music and the City University of New York. Wait till you hear her play. Let's put a hand together for her. And finally, and finally, the reason that everybody is together. Everybody is here to support the tenor, the tenor, Alexander Mikovich. He is a history professor at Union County College here in New Jersey. And after graduating also from Vanderbilt, he worked for 15 years at various universities across the country. And then this is what I like about him. He decided to fulfill his childhood dream. He went back to school and he got a degree in vocal performance, which he is using. We are one of the many areas that are blessed to have him with us tonight. He sings at churches and for events throughout the country. And we're so glad that the classical series, that the Hellenic studies and that the Papa's series has him with us tonight. You are in for a treat. I can hardly wait. You're going to love each piece as we walk through opera and see its classical roots. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our team tonight. Well, thank you very much, Professor Beverly. And uh, we are moving to the, our concert with the lectures. Let me introduce you with the Hellenic themes in the classical music. So it is often asserted that Western music started in ancient Greece. Hellenic influence is uh, present in church music throughout the Middle Ages. During the Renaissance in 1573 in Florence, ancient Greek drama was revived under the patronage of Count Giovanni de Bardi. In 1598, together, a musician, Jacobo Peri, and the poet Ottavio Rinuccini created Daphne as a new form called opera. In Peri, Rinuccini production, entire drama is to be sung in monodic style, that is to say, the style of one singing with the accompanist. This is Palazzo Bardi in Florence. The Camerato Society gathered in Palazzo Bardi with one and very clear goal to revive ancient Greek drama. So, in 1573, the patron of Camerata Society was the Count Giovanni de Bardi. This is his palace. Opera Lariana by Claudio Monteverdi. The one of the earliest opera is Larian. Lariana. In English, we pronounce as Ariadne. It was produced by Italian composer Claudio Monteverdi. In particular, Ariadne is Monteverdi's second opera, and it was composed from 1607 to 1608. The first performance of this opera was on May 28 in 16, 1608 as a part of the musical festivities for a royal wedding at the court of Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga in Mantua. Unfortunately, the opera is lost, but the captivating aria Lamento d'Ariani survived. Monteverdi's opera is inspired by ancient Greek myth of Ariadne. In this story, while the monster Minotaur fought with Theseus in Crete, Ariadne saved the life of Theseus. However, Theseus, who is the founder of Athens, abandons Ariadne at the island of Naxos. Finally, God Dionysus finds distressed Ariadne, consoles and marries her. This is a very popular theme. So here we have Ariadne myth in a visual art. The myth of Ariadne is represented in this painting, which is entitled Bacchus and Ariadne, produced by Italian artist Tiziano Vecelio, known in English as Titian. Bacchus here is Latinized form of the Greek god Dionysus, who saved Ariadne. Lamento d'Ariana is the area from the opera Larian by Monteverdi, in which Ariane, abandoned by Theseus, sings about her longing to die. So, in words, let me die, let me die, and what you would think would comfort me. 
in a such a harsh fate, in a such a great martyrdom, let me die. Thank you. So we are moving to opera seria, which is also known in Italian as drama per musica or melodrama. That was art form which predominated Europe from 1710 to 1770s. It's often elaborated on historical themes from classical Greek and Roman history, infused and spiced with some mythological content. The Rome-based Academy of Arcadia sought to return Italian opera to what they viewed as neoclassical principles, obeying the classical unities of drama defined by Aristotle and replacing frivolous plots with highly moral narrative that aimed to instruct. The famous composers of the time wrote opera seria such as Antonio Caldara, Alessandro Scarlatti, Georg Friedrich Handel, or Antonio Vivaldi. Alessandro Scarlatti, the master of opera seria. He was an Italian Baroque composer, known especially for his operas and chamber cantatas. He is considered the most important representative of Napolitan school of opera. Here we have the painting, the preparation for opera performance that becomes the subject matter in Marco Ricci's painting rehearsal for the opera of opera Il Piro e Demetrio. So, Alessandro Scarlatti composed opera seria, seria Il Piro e Demetrio in 1694. The first performance was at Teatro San Bartolomeo in Napoli which is today the Church of San Carlo. Il Piro e Demetrio was one of the most popular nationally and internationally, so it was performed in Rome, Siena, Livorno, Milan, Florence, Brunswick. Il Piro e Demetrio was adapted to Pyrrhus and Demetrius in order to be performed in London that stay from 1708 to 1717, 1717 as a blockbuster. Okay. So, <clears throat> history and myth are really fused in Scarlatti's opera Il Piro e Demetrio. The action of Scarlatti's opera is set in ancient Macedonia. It is the time when the successor, the Adohin Greek uh, of Alexander the Great, fight for the throne. So, it was Demetrius who has seized the throne of Macedonia 
after having murdered Alexander the Great. Moreover, he also murdered Thessalonica, the half-sister of Alexander the Great. Demetrius wants to invade Asia and capture Alexander's empire. Yet, the king of Epirus, Pyrrhus, together with Ptolemy, Seleucus, and Lysimachus, join forces against Demetrius. Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus, succeeded in driving out Demetrius and replacing him on the throne. Here we have the sculptor uh, Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus, of the king of Epirus. He was a real and historical personality who is known from the time of Hellenistic period. Actually, he was the king, the king coming from the time of Molossians, and later on in his life, Pyrrhus became the king of Epirus. He is regarded as one of the greatest generals of antiquity. Importantly, he was also one of the strongest opponents of early Rome. However, in Scarlatti's opera in Il Piro e Dimitrio, Venetian uh, librettist Adriano Morselli presents the king of Epirus, Pyrrhus, as a very shy and insecure person. Let us say something about Thessalonica, mythical heroine, because in this narrative we have a popular Greek legend in, uh, which explains the etiology of mermaid and gorgons as the creatures who lived in Aegean, Aegean waters for hundreds of years. So the narrative uh, states that Alexander, in his quest for the fountain of immortality, retrieved a flask of immortal water in which he bathed his sister's hair. When Alexander passed away, his grief striking sister, Thessalonica, attempted to end her life by jumping into the sea. Instead of drawing, however, she became a mermaid, passing judgment on mariners throughout the centuries and across the seven seas. Here we have the riddle of Thessalonica. The sailors who encountered her, she would always pose the same question. In Greek is, Zi o Vasilias Alexandros? Is the King Alexander alive? The correct answer to this question would be, Zi ke Vasilevi ke ton kosmo kirievi. He lives and reigns and conquers the world. Given this answer, Thessalonica would allow the ship and her crew to sail safely away in calm seas. But any other answer would transform Thessalonica into a raging gorgon bent on sending the ship and every sailor on board to the bottom. In his libretto for Scarlatti's Piero e Dimitrio, Adriano Morselli also creates a love intrigue around two couples, uh, that is actually three si two sisters and two brothers, who eventually end up paired with one another. The character singing the aria, Le Violette, is a young guy named Mario. He's, allow he's alone in the garden, thinking about his love for a woman who is nobly born. Mario is asking the Violet if he's so of finding the love with a certain someone are too ambitious. The aria Le Violette is a fresh, light and a charming aria. There is a lovely playfulness to this aria, especially as the melodic line is echoed and accompanied throughout. A rough idea of this song meaning is, are these violets a message for me? Do I have a ma too much ambition? Am I aiming too high in loving such a wonderful woman? So here we have the uh, poetry, Alexandro Scarlatti music and the words by Adriano Morselli. Le Violette, dewy, scented, pretty, violets, you are standing shy, 
half hidden among the leaves and you scold my desires that are too ambitious. Let us listen the music now. Rujatose odorose Violette Graziose Rujatose odorose Violette Graziose Violette Graziose Voi vi state vergognose Mezzo scose Sascose fra le foglie e sgridate le mie voglie che son troppo ambiziose e sgridate le mie voglie che son troppo, son troppo ambiziose. Rugiatose, odorose, violette, violette, graziose. Rugiatose, odorose, violette, violette, graziose, violette, graziose. Voi vi state vergognose. Mezzo scose fra le foglie e sgridate le mie voglie che son troppo ambiziose. E sgridate le mie voglie che son troppo, son troppo ambiziose. Rugiatose odorose. Violette, violette, graziose, rugiatose, odorose, violette, violette, graziose, violette, violette, graziose. With Roman mythology. Handel produced masterful opera Seria Semele in 1744. It is based on pre existent opera libretto by William Congreve. The story comes from Ovid's Metamorphosis and concerns Semele, the mother of Bacchus, Greek Dionysus. Greek myths are transformed here and adapted to Roman mythology. It was first presented in concert form in 1744. So let us explain how the Roman myth suppressed Bible-based subject matter. Semela was first performed on February 1744 at the Covent Garden Theatre in London. Interestingly enough, it was presented as a part of a concert series held yearly during the Lent. Yet, those people who attending the opening night of Handel Semele were displeased, for they expected a very different kind of entertainment. The audience naturally expected Bible-based subject matter, yet the amorous topic of Semele, which is creation of late restoration period, transparently drew on Roman mythology. So, unfortunately, that was the last opera by, composed by Handel, which is not surprised. Let us see the myth of Semele. Juno is incensed by Jupiter's affair with Semele, as she determined to destroy the woman who has displaced her. She decides that she will need help from Somnus, the god of sleep. In her palace, Semele awakes. With area, oh sleep, why don't thou leave me? Jupiter enters 
and the two renew their affection. But Samela is not entirely happy. She is only mortal and feels frightened when Jupiter leaves her. In order to distract Samele from wishing for immortality, Jupiter brings Eno, the sister of Samele, to Samele for company. Jupiter transforms the scene to mythical place of Arcadia, celebrated as unspoiled, harmonious wilderness. Here we have the words of Arya, wherever you walk, in which Jupiter transforms the scene to Arcadia and leaves the sisters, Eno and Semele together to enjoy the harmony of the spheres. Okay, so these are the words. You can follow on the screen and listen carefully to the music. Enjoy.
Okay. So this is the image of uh, Christoph Wilbald Gluck, who with a series of radical new works in 1760s, among them Orfeo ed Euridice and Alceste, broke the stranghold that classical opera seria had enjoyed for much of the century. Under the patronage of Marie Antoinette, who had married the future French king Louis XVI in 1770, uh, Christophe Wilbold Gluck signed a contract for six stage works with the management of the Paris, Paris Opera. Gluck introduced more drama by using simple recitative and cutting the usually long da capo aria, like this one we just heard the, uh, from Semele, and his later operas have half of the length of a typical Baroque opera. Orfeo ed Euridice, the Gleek's first reformed opera. So Orpheus and Eurydice in English belongs to the genre of an opera on mythological subject with choruses and dancing. It is an opera seria based on the myth of Orpheus and set to a libretto by Ranieri del Casabigi. Orfeo and Eurydice is the first Gluck's reform operas in which he attempted to replace the abstruse plots and overly complex music of opera seria with a noble simplicity in both the music and drama. Okay, let's see in detail the Orpheus myth. Apollo gave his son Orpheus a lyre and taught him how to play. It had been said that nothing could resist Orpheus' beautiful melodies neither enemies nor beasts. Orpheus fell in love with Eurydice, a woman of beauty and grace, whom he married and lived happily with for a short time. But a short time after the marriage, Eurydice has been wandering in the forest with the nymphs. Some versions of the story relate the Eurydice is merely dancing with the nymphs. In any case, while fleeing or dancing, she was bitten by a snake and died instantly. And that's the reason Orpheus desired to go into the underworld. So, Orpheus decided to descend to the Hades to see his wife. Any other mortal would have died, but Orpheus, being protected, by the gods, goes to hate and arrives a Stygian realm, passing by ghosts and souls of people unknown. He also managed to attract Cerberus, the three-headed dog, with a, a linking to for his music. He later presented himself in front of the god of the Greek underworld, Hate, who is Pluto in Roman mythology, and his wife, Persephone. Hades told Orpheus that he can take Eurydice with him, but under one condition. She would have to follow him while walking out in the light from the caves of the underworld. But he should not look at her before coming out of the light, or else he might lose her forever. If Orpheus is patient, he might have Eurydice again by his side. But, unable to hear Eurydice's footsteps, he began fearing the gods had fooled him. Eurydice might have been behind him, only a few feet away from the exit. Orpheus lost his fate and turns to see Eurydice behind him, but her shade was whisked back among the dead, now trapped with hates forever. Orfeo started playing a mourning song with his lyre, calling for death so that he can be united with Eurydice forever. 
he was killed either by beasts tearing him apart or by manants in a frenzied mood. According to another version, Zeus decided to strike him with lightning knowing Orpheus may reveal the secrets of the underworld to humans. So here we have the lament of Orpheus in French and also in English translation. In this area, Orpheus started playing, playing a mooring song with his lyre, calling for death so that he can be united with Eurydice forever. Please let us hear this sad song. Coming to the 
famous uh, Italian composer, Giacchino Rossini, and uh, composed opera La Siege of Corinth um, at the time of the Greek War of Independence. So, Giacchino Rossini was an Italian composer and a real superstar who gained fame for his 39 operas, including many on Greek topics. He was called as a great Phil Hellen, friend of the Greeks, because he was obsessed with the Greek War of Independence and the need to help the Greek free themselves from the Turkish occupation. Let us say a few words about the Greek War of Independence that occurred in 1821 to 1829, 19th century. A successful war of independence against the Ottoman Empire between, um, between 1821 and 1829. The Greeks were assisted by great powers, Great Britain, France and Russia. This war led to the formation of the modern Greece we know today. This revolution is celebrated as the Independence Day on March 25th. This painting is produced by Theodoros Vrizakis and the theme is Breakout from of Missolonghi. The siege of Missolonghi was fought between Ottoman Empire and the Greek rebels. In 1820, uh, 1825 to 1826, the Ottomans had already tried and failed to capture, to capture the city in uh, 1822 and 23. The Greeks held out for almost a year before they ran out of food and attempted a mass breakout, which was a di real disaster. This defeat at Missolonghi was a key factor leading to intervention by the great powers who succumbed to the public pressure of Philhellness and decisively helped the Greek cause. So, we can follow the Europe in the grip of Hellenophilia. So, what is the meaning of this word? So, it's somebody or someone who has a love of Greece and or Greek culture uh, from ancient to modern. For example, in this painting, we see how uh, English poet Lord, ba Lord Byron arrives to Greece to help the revolutionaries. The siege of Missolonghi as a uh, beca becomes a, f a philhellenic theme in music, visual, and literary arts. So, Rossini produced opera La Siege of Corinth that com com commemorates the siege and the ultimate destruction of the town of Missolonghi in 1826 by Turkish troops during the ongoing uh, Greek War of Independence. The same incident is condemned throughout Western Europe for its cruelty, but inspired a prominent painting by Eugène Delacroix, famous uh, French uh, painter, uh, with this image that you have in front of you, Greece expiring on the ruins of Missolonghi. Uh, this is also uh, mentioned in the writings of Victor Hugo. Phil Allen is uh, working together. So, uh, Joaquin Rossini and Lord Byron come together in this plot of the opera. In the plot of opera La Siege de Corinth, Rossini and his French librettist Alexandre Soumé combine the story of the Siege of Corinth from 1470s by evoking contemporary events in Missolonghi with the love story described in Lord Byron's famous poem Jaur and Hassan. This love triangle is created between young Greek called Neocles, his love interest Palmyra, 
and charming unknown Greek Turk, who turns out to be none other than Sultan Mehmed II, the conqueror. So on your uh, screen, you have the picture, the siege of Missolonghi. Let us see the characters in the opera. So Rossini created for Paris opera in 1826 at the height of Philhellenism, uh, the opera La Siege of Corinth during the Greek War of Independence. The action of this opera is set in 1458, however, when Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II, the conqueror, taking, uh, was taking over Greece and laid siege to the city of Corinth. So we see how Rossini connects the historical events with the love triangle, including young Greek Neocles, his love Palmyra, who had fallen in love with the unknown Turk, who turns out to be Mehmed II. This is the image of Mehmed II, the conqueror, because there was indeed the siege of city of Corinth in 1470s under this Sultan. Rossini plays the action of his opera in this period, but it was clear to everyone in the audience that Rossini had in mind the events at Missolonghi in 1826. Let us see another famous motif from this opera, the motif of Oriental cruelty. <clears throat> in his poem, Jaur and Hassan, Lord Byron talks about Leila, who is a member of Hassan's harem. Hassan is Leila's Muslim master. Leila falls in love with a Christian called by Turks the Jaur. Hassan punished her by being drowned in the sea. In revenge, the Christian Jaur kills Hassan. And afterward, he enters a monastery due to his remorse. So you see on the screen the painting, another painting by great Philelnas, Eugene de la Croix, Jaur and Hassan in the battle. Rossini, librettist Alexander Soumé, reverses the plot of Lord Byron's poem Jaur and Hassan. While in Lord Byron's poem, it's a Greek man who kills a Turk because of woman, in opera, it's Mehmed II who falls in love with Palmyra, with a Greek woman, and offer to spare the Greeks if she marries him. She refuses to do so, and she dies together with her father and the young Greek officer, Neocles, was her betrothed. Here we have the monologue of Neocles before the failed breakout. You see? And you have the translation on the other side. Okay, so let us hear this carefully. And it's a long... Come, let me go. 
recently died and in honor of both of them we're gonna conclude this concert with Nikis Theodorakis uh, on, and, the, and the song of George Seferis which is coming up on the next slide so you can see the lyrics okay. and feel free to join <laughs> Sto per i ali to crifo, asprosan per i steri, dipsa sa meto messi meri, mato. Amoti Santi Grab Santono Matis Ore Abofisi Seovatis Kesvisti Keti Graphic. 
Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it so much. <laughs>